So in this video, I want to talk about the different drugs used to treat type 2 diabetes and will particularly focus on the efficacy of these drugs and on some important clinical pearls. So let's start with metformin. So metformin is our first-line agent. So this is a drug that almost everybody with type 2 diabetes is going to get. So the efficacy is very high. So we determine the efficacy in terms of how much reduction of A1C the drug can achieve. We can put the efficacy into three categories. Drugs with high efficacy lower the A1C more than 1.5% with moderate efficacy between 1 and 1.5 and with low efficacy below 1%. So metformin is a high efficacy drug because it can lower the A1C more than 1.5%. What is metformin's mechanism of action? It activates AMP kinase. So this is an enzyme, and you can find also AMP kinase downstream insulin signaling. Therefore, we call metformin sometimes an insulin sensitizer because it just jumps on insulin signaling downstream at the AMP kinase levels, and then does kind of trigger similar actions than insulin. So metformin is a great drug because it has high efficacy and then a very low hypoglycemia risk. Also, it does not lead to weight gain, and the major adverse effects are GI effects. So a lot of patients are going to complain about nausea and vomiting, a lot of diarrhea and metallic taste, so metformin for metallic taste. And then rarely it can also lead to lactic acidosis. The reason is that metformin increases lactate production by uncoupling mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylations, specifically in the gut. And then it also reduces lactate removal by the liver as it blocks gluconeogenesis. So it kind of does a couple of things that will, in the end, increase lactate production. And therefore, you should be very careful in patients with renal impairment as metformin is excreted completely via the kidney. That means if you have renal impairment, you're going to lead to higher uh, metformin levels, and therefore you can also trigger higher lactate levels. And then because lactate is metabolized or is, we get rid of lactate in the liver, we should also be careful in patients with hepatic impairment because if we cannot get rid of lactate, then we are also more prone to lactic acidosis. One of AMP kinase downstream effects is to decrease cholesterol, triglyceride, and fatty acid synthesis. So therefore, metformin also improves lipid profile, and that's obviously a good thing. So patients are normally started on metformin. However, if the A1C target is not achieved, well, then you have to add another drug. And so let's discuss a couple of other options that we have. Well, another drug that we always can consider certainly is insulin, and this has probably the highest efficacy, as this is open-ended, depending on how much you give. So insulin acts at the insulin receptor, a tyrosine kinase receptor. The hypoglycemia risk is very high, and that should make sense, because always if you give a patient extra insulin, well, insulin is going to lower your blood glucose levels. Therefore, you have a very high risk of developing hypoglycemia. Insulin is a fat-storing hormone, so therefore you should be not surprised that it can lead to weight gain. The next class of drugs that we're going to discuss are the sulfonylureas, also high-efficacious drugs, and they inhibit the ATP-sensitive potassium channel. So by just closing the potassium channel, there's going to be more positive charges accumulating inside the pancreatic beta cell, leading to membrane depolarization. Calcium is going to get in, and insulin is going to be released from the beta cell. So whenever you make some extra insulin, and definitely with this drug class, well, your hypoglycemia risk is going to be high because you just kick out extra insulin independent of your glucose levels, and therefore the glucose is going to go down. And then it's also going to lead to weight gain. So those two always go together because it means whenever you kick out extra insulin, insulin is going to lead to hypoglycemia, insulin is going to lead to weight gain. So you're always going to have them coupled when the mechanism is due to in extra insulin. We should be careful in patients with renal and hepatic disease because these drugs are metabolized in the liver and excreted via the kidney.
So another drug class are the GLP-1 agonists. They are injectable, so as similar to insulin, and they are also high efficacious drugs. They act on the GLP-1 receptor, GS-coupled receptor, sitting, for example, on the pancreatic beta cell, and then leading to phosphorylation of the calcium channel. And if there is membrane depolarization, it makes the calcium channel open better, and therefore we get some insulin release. But very importantly, as conscious to this other medication that we discussed, it does not work in the absence of glucose. Therefore, our hypoglycemia risk is very low because it's not going to give us some extra insulin. It's just going to give us a little bit more in response to glucose. And therefore, because the risk is low, there's no extra insulin, there's also no weight gain. And these drugs, as I've discussed in another video, have also other mechanisms of action. They also decrease our appetite, so that's going to help also with weight loss, and they are even approved as obesity drugs, and they also slow down gastric emptying. So if your food sits forever in the stomach, you're probably not going to eat so much. So that all gets into the weight loss. And then they have a lot of GI adverse effects, and they are also predictable because, well, if your food sits forever in the stomach, you're going to feel very nauseous. And therefore, these are these adverse effects. Also, pancreatitis can happen. It's rather rare. And then they have a very specific contraindication. It's actually a black box warning. It should be not taken in patients with thyroid C-cell tumors because they found that if you give GLP agonists to rats, their thyroid C-cells undergo hyperplasia. Because those drugs slow gastric emptying, you should also take them apart from other drugs, which makes sense because if your patient is on more drugs, I mean, these drugs are going to also sit in the stomach for a while. So another exciting benefit of this GLP-1 agonist is that they decrease cardiovascular risk. So they are actually approved for the reduction in cardiovascular mortality in type 2 diabetes patients with established cardiovascular disease. And as a lot of them have that, that's an obvious beneficial effect of these drugs. So we're going to now move on to the glitazones, the TCDs. They all in glitazone, have the C in the name. And they are medium efficacy, so we're going a little bit down. Um, those drugs act via the PPAR gamma receptor, that's a nuclear receptor. And interestingly, this is also a target of AMP kinase, so you can think about them mechanistically, again, as insulin sensitizers that just act downstream insulin signaling. The hypoglycemia risk is low. They don't kick you out extra insulin. However, those drugs lead to weight gain. The mechanism behind the weight gain is actually different from the other drugs that I have discussed because they have effects in the kidney and they lead to edema. So therefore, the weight gain might be related to the edema, to the more water retention. Those drugs have also a lot of other toxicities. I mean, they're pretty hepatotoxic. They also lead to bone loss. And then those guys increase risk for bladder cancer, another cancer warning here. And then they're absolutely contraindicated in patients with heart failures or black box warning, which should make sense because they lead to edema. So these drugs also improve the lipid profile, similarly to metformin. And it kind of makes sense because PPAR gamma signaling also converges with AMP kinase signaling. And we know that AMP kinase decreases cholesterol, triglycerides, and fatty acid synthesis in the liver. So therefore, um, that might explain this improvement in lipid profiles of also the glitazones. So now, the last two classes that I want to discuss are gliflozin. So these are the SGLT2 inhibitors. They act at the kidney. They inhibit the reabsorption of glucose. So you're just going to get rid of more glucose. The hypoglycemia risk is low. They also lead to weight loss. And you can think about that easily just by thinking that, well, you're just going to pee out more glucose, so you're just going to get rid of more calories. Also, their adverse effects are predictable. Well, you're going to are more prone to develop urinary tract infection because you have all this glucose around in your urine. 
They also can lead to diabetic ketoacidosis. And then because you, they are basically diuretic, so you can be get dehydrated, and that can then also lead to hypotension. This is a second class of drug that has been shown to decrease cardiovascular risks. As these drugs act in the kidney, we should be careful in patients with severe renal impairment. So the last class of drugs that we can consider for a type 2 diabetic patient are the gliptins. These are the DPP-4 inhibitors. They have the IN inhibitor and the P for DPP-4 in its name. And so DPP-4 is this enzyme that decreates the GLP-1, and therefore you're just going to have more GLP-1 around. And so generally we think about it from a mechanistical perspective similarly than the GLP-1 agonist. I've already explained in another video that it's not completely true. So they lack the effects on the brain and also the effect at the stomach. And so therefore their major effect is the pancreatic beta cell. And this might explain that they have way lower efficacy. As their effect on the pancreatic beta cell is dependent on glucose, they don't kick out any extra insulin, so therefore we have a low risk of hypoglycemia and then also they are weight neutral. Because TPP4 might have an immunological role that could explain that we see in this patient an increased risk of infections, particularly respiratory infections. Rashes have been reported as well as angioedema, and turns out that DPP-4 might be also involved in the breakdown of bradykinin, so that could explain the angioedema risk. So there are two more classes that don't regularly show up on the American Diabetes Association algorithm, but still might be tested on the boards, are the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors and the non-sulfonylureas. So the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, as the name already implies, inhibit alpha-glucosidase, an enzyme that breaks down glycogen. And if you cannot break down glycogen, well, you're not going to end up with monosaccharides like glucose. And as we only can absorb monosaccharides, we're going to absorb less glucose. And that's obviously a good mechanism of action to just absorb less glucose. They have, however, low efficacy and also go along with a low hypoglycemia risk. They rather lead to weight loss or a weight neutral because you're just going to absorb less calories. And the major adverse effects are GI-related adverse effects because they act in the GI tract. The non-sulfonylureas, they all end in glinide, act basically identical with the sulfonylureas. They just don't show up as often on kind of guidelines how to treat type 2 diabetic patients because they're way more expensive than the sulfonylureas and don't give any additional benefits. This concludes the video on the different treatment options for type 2 diabetic patients.